Um, thank you, everybody. I, I'm not sure about the metaphor of something that has certain extinction uh, <laughs> associated with it, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, it's, it's a huge honor uh, to be asked to give tonight's lecture, given those that have in the past, and a great honor to be introduced by Joan, whose, um, whose work I'll actually uh, reference um, later on. Um, I don't particularly see myself as a, a thought leader. I, I think I'm somebody that spent 20 years as a doer, really, and at the cold face, or as we should say now, the photovoltaic face of, uh, of trying to handle um, environmental issues. Um, the central premise of what I want to talk about this evening, really, is that our current banking system undermines uh, all the efforts people in this room make to progress on environmental change. Uh, and, uh, and you may recall that um, during the, uh, the last election, our Prime Minister, um, in addressing a question from a nurse about pay, said there is no magic money tree. Um, well, I, I would challenge that because um, there is a magic money tree. It's been in our garden for... Uh, decades, we've actually lost sight of it and we need to prune it and shape it so it fruits in the right way to benefit the environment and society again. And that tree uh, is our banking system, which could be a very different force for good um, channeled in the right way. Um, I, uh, uh, I also uh, am conscious that um, because of my endangered white rhino status, I was invited here in partly to explain myself and how an environmentalist um, ends up running uh, a bank, and I'll uh, endeavour to do that um, uh, in a moment. Uh, I think, though, I should also just explain a little bit um, uh, about Triodos. I'm not in any way here this evening to, to sell or promote a, a bank, but to perhaps give some context on, on, on what we do and, and what my job is. Um, we, we're described as Europe's leading sustainable bank, and the sustainable really means three things. I mean, we, we have a stated mission uh, uh, as a bank to finance uh, and promote a human quality of life and a society that has human dignity uh, at its core. And we do that by um, financing things that can only demonstrate a positive environmental, social uh, and cultural impact. So we're often described as a green bank, but it's much more uh, holistic in that respect. And the, the second element of, of being that sustainable bank is our banking model. And I'm not going to bore you to tears with what that means, but uh, uh, it's very different to other banks. We, um, uh, we only uh, lend a proportion of the funds entrusted to us, so we don't borrow from other banks. We hold much higher levels of reserve. Uh, and so the whole model is different, including our ownership structure. Um, and then the third thing, really, is, is how we try to run our business. Every sinew of how we try to run the bank really tries to reflect the highest environmental uh, and social standards. So uh, the bank is uh, about 14 billion euros in terms of its balance sheet size, operating in six European countries. Uh, and I'm managing director of Triodos here in the UK, where our balance sheet is about 1.2 billion, approaching that. Uh, and we have about 170 staff here in the UK. So, um, so that's just context on where I come from. And really, where I reference Triodos very rarely through the presentation, it's really to give you an insight from, from that doer uh, at the face as to our perspective and, uh, and how we link into some of the issues uh, that I'll talk about. So um, it's always difficult to talk about yourself, uh, I think. But, um, uh, but this is me. Uh, I'm the little one. Uh, and uh, this is actually when I had the great pleasure to um, um, spend some time photographing whale sharks for research and identification purposes, um, which uh, um, this is really me and my element. This is my great passion, being close to nature, interacting with wildlife. That was always a thread in my early years. Uh, and I suppose um, the key inflection points I in my career started when I was um, a student. I was a, a business uh, student, and as part of that, I studied uh, in Sweden for a year. And, uh, and during that year, I actually lost my father, which put me in a very sort of reflective place in life. He was, he was a teacher, and I was sort of very taken with the swathes of letters my mother got telling us, you know, what an impact he'd had on people's lives. So I was there thinking, well, what impact do I want to have in my life? And I was also living in a society that in the mid-90s I would have described as futuristic. The recycling schemes they had in Sweden, their whole respect for the natural environment, how they interact with it, how they integrate it into planning decisions, how much time they actually spend in nature. A very different um, society to be in. And that was really uh, where your sort of very standard business graduate who had done a business degree because it seemed a general thing to do that would keep lots of options open. Uh, I sort of morphed into being somebody passionate about corporate environmental management, and that's really where I started. And I moved on to do postgraduate work that was looking at market failures and market barriers to developing the recycling sector in the UK, and that was the start of a 10 years, really, working in the, the recycling industry, the latter six of which were for the Waste and Resources Action Programme, as Joan said, 
Uh, and there, my role was to um, adv advise and uh, support businesses in raising private sector investment to a growing industry. Uh, and the team of people I worked with worked introducing businesses to lots of banks. We provided government money as guarantees uh, to banks and so on. And uh, that was really a moment in my career where, for the first time, I, I realized the very narrow focus the banking industry has on purely financial return rather than wider social benefit. Uh, and also, in my opinion, an industry that has a hugely overinflated sense of its own self-worth uh, to society. And that was my first experience um, of it. Um, Anyway, my, my career then moved on. I spent some time doing um, different um, types of uh, 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 conservation volunteering work uh, for a year. Um, and, uh, and during that time, I was approached to uh, go and lead Triodos Bank's um, lending in the UK. So I was head of business banking for five years. I chose a really good time to go in the ba into banking, the start of 2008. Uh, so, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, it worked out quite well because I was with a bank with a very different model uh, and we grew very rapidly before I was um, uh, then offered the opportunity to be chief executive of a wildlife trust, which as you can imagine was a wonderful coming together of personal interest and professional capability. Um, before I was then asked to go back and, uh, uh, and consider running um, the bank again. And it was not an easy, obvious decision, actually. I debated it, leaving this sort of where your heart is uh, to come and do this. And I'll, I'll explain sort of why I decided to come back uh, in a moment. But, um, but the fact I did come back has been the source of great curiosity. And I've been dubbed the first environmentalist to run a bank. And uh, it's interesting that, you know, the, the sort of coverage it got. And it, it kind of told me two things. First, the sort of, that naturally people already perceive that banks aren't good for the environment. Uh, and secondly, probably that uh, environmentalists are seen as the enemy of banks in many ways. Um, and I suppose additionally, it also tells me that I think we really need to broaden our thinking about what an environmentalist has to be to affect change. Uh, and we tend to think of um, uh, environmentalists being like the people in this room or people like me that had a chartered qualification from my days in the recycling sector. Uh, and actually what we need to inspire is environmentalists in lots of other uh, sectors, in architecture, in medicine, uh, and so on and, uh, and so forth. Um, so uh, why did I come back um, to uh, uh, run a bank? I think since the financial crisis, we, we, we've seen different phases of public debate. Um, initially, the public debate was all around how do we stop this happening, how do we deal with this, how do we deal with the contagion, uh, and so on. Then it shifted to how do we stop this happening again, and we've seen new regulation uh, around banking, and uh, um, uh, new sort of uh, something called the senior manager's conduct regime that holds senior people more accountable for what happens. We've seen banks required to hold higher levels of reserves to buffer them against shocks and so on, and that's all great progress. And then I think now we're at a really interesting and exciting moment where we're actually starting to have a debate uh, about what the role of banks are in society and is this system really serving us, uh, and uh, particularly around um, what our money does. And so I, with the, the, the bank launching a personal current account earlier this year, it was a moment I really wanted to seize to come back and try and blow that debate wide open, really, and I hope to make some contribution to that um, this evening. Um, so, let's talk about banking. Um, this beautiful creature is a female elephant seal that I had the fortune to spend some time with on a remote island in the Pacific off the um, coast of Baja, California. And um, <coughs> they're wonderful creatures, very peaceful, but the issue with elephant seals is they have a design fault. Um, the design fault is that no sooner have they um, given birth to their pups do they start mating again. And you think, well, what's wrong with that? That sounds quite efficient. Um, but uh, the issue lies in the fact the, um, the males look like this. Uh, <laughs> and they are four or five times sometimes uh, bigger than the females. Um, and uh, they're incredibly territorial. They fight viciously uh, for their territory on the beach and their harems uh, of female um, seals. And um, uh, it, as a consequence of that, if you're a young pup uh, caught up in the wake of um, mating and fighting, um, life can be quite high risk. So I don't know if you can see in this photograph that there's a small pup there next to its mother, uh, and Dad's just about to show a lot of interest. So it's quite a hazardous place to be. Uh, and as a result, there's um, very high infant mortality. I was astonished walking these beaches just how many pup carcasses you see 
Uh, and, uh, and so um, I, I, I should have warned you there was sex and violence in the presentation. I'm sorry about that. But the, um, you'll see this one's okay, just for those uh, the, the faint-hearted amongst you. This one got away. Uh, I was there to witness it uh, uh, safely moving on. Um, but you'll see the hazard. And so my metaphor for the way the banking industry has behaved, really, since the Big Bang of 1986 uh, is as a bull elephant seal. Uh, with no real awareness of the wider society that it's operating in and the consequence it has, uh, and so on. And um, I think we've seen swathes of scandals that I don't intend to touch on uh, and uh, that, that really underline that. And uh, I can tell you that they haven't stopped. There's an all-party parliamentary group on fair business banking that we're associate um, uh, members of and so on, and they're working on a number of issues and cases that will continue to come to light in the current years. But I'm not putting this slide up to bank bash. Um, there's a lot of good people in banking that want to see change um, themselves. And actually, our media is far too focused on the bank bashing and this sort of low-hanging fruit of stories that it generates. And the discussion we have to be having is actually about what this banking system is, the role it should play, and what our money um, is used for. Um, and on that point, that is increasingly um, gathering attention. Some of you may have seen this that um, about a month ago, uh, Christian Aid launched a campaign called The Big Shift, which was fronted by uh, Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop uh, of Canterbury, which was really trying to draw attention to the extent of fossil fuel investment, uh, it, it's the extent of fossil fuel investment that's still going on uh, within our um, large um, mainstream banks. And uh, I'll come back to the significance of that point um, later on. But that is not a sole campaign. Greenpeace successfully uh, lobbied one of our big banks to change their policy on financing uh, palm oil production and the deforestation uh, that it causes. Uh, and most inspiringly, a local community uh, near one of the UK um, fracking plants uh, successfully sort of um, drew huge attention through social media uh, to one of our uh, large banks that was funding that project. So people on different levels are really starting to wake up to the fact that our money is being used for things that is not necessarily serving our long-term interests uh, and the health of our um, planet and, uh, and society. Um, so <clears throat> the role of banks could be very different. This is another friend of mine. Um, this is a pregnant seahorse. And um, the reason uh, I, you're looking at a pregnant seahorse is because in the world of the seahorse, it's the male that gets pregnant. Um, the, the, the male has a pouch, the female pops the eggs into that pouch, he fertilizes them and he incubates them and, and, and ultimately um, releases them uh, into the wild. So this is my visual metaphor for the complete role reversal that I would like to see uh, in banking. And um, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, banks are essential intermediaries in our society. Um, and in fulfilling an intermediary role, they generate a value. That value lies between what they charge people borrowing money and what they pay to people who put money uh, into the bank. And then there's additional value from various fees and services that they provide uh, in between and so on. So um, the question really is then, I think there is a responsibility to distribute that value fairly between shareholders, customers, and employees uh, who ultimately generate that value. And I think if I leave you to reflect for a few moments, you might actually uh, agree with me that I think what we've seen historically is that value principally being distributed to shareholders and senior employees who are incentivized to serve the interests of those shareholders. Uh, and so that's something we have to um, change in our um, mindset. I think then we have to think about what the, um, the, the, the role of banks uh, actually is. And um, I mean, we certainly um, see ourselves as a, a change agent. So, uh, and other banks could do that as well. We, we, we have huge power as banks to influence um, outcomes and make things happen. And some examples of that, we use pricing to incentivize behavioral change uh, at times. So uh, people are credited under the Sustainable Restaurant Association or the Green Tourism uh, 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 um, certification and so on. We, um, if they move up in the um, standards of sustainability of their business, we reduce their interest rate. We do the same in countries where we provide personal mortgages. If you improve the energy rating of your house, your interest rate um, uh, will drop. You can also target risk appetite. So we as a bank try to put envelopes um, uh, uh, around certain pots of money where we're going to accept a higher degree of risk because we really want to see progress in that sector and we really see that as particularly high impact. 
banks are also huge sources of expertise uh, and, uh, and resources, and, um, and they could put a lot more uh, into sort of progressing different agendas. So at the minute, we've, we've spent the last 18 months putting an awful lot of time and resources into uh, energy storage and looking at energy storage solutions and how they could be financed uh, in the UK. So, um, so that's the sort of vision for the role I would like to see banks playing in our society, using that power for good and effecting real change uh, as a consequence. But let's keep perspective. A jellyfish isn't bigger than a 16-foot whale shark. Um, and I'm just some imaginative environmentalist with a hemp shirt and some sandals uh, talking to you uh, about banking. Um, or am I? Well, I think what we lose sight of is that our banks are not disconnected from the natural environment in which they operate. And uh, it, it's uh, a fact that got quickly lost sight of that one of the major triggers for the financial crisis of 2008 was Hurricane Katrina, which, as you know, devastated many of the southern states, but that really exposed the flaws in the subprime mortgage market because it left lots of people with 110, 120% mortgages who hadn't insured their properties because they had no equity in those properties. They had no interest in insuring them. And that was a major catalyst for what then uh, followed. So banks are not disconnected from environmental consequences. Uh, and that's, that's the fundamental flaw in how we think about banking. It's, it's, it's an industry over there. It's sat doing its own thing. It's not integrated uh, it, into, um, into what the money's um, being used for and, uh, and what it's um, fulfilling. And other people are now starting to um, uh, think in, in, in this way, um, uh, including um, central banks. Uh, and Joan, um, in her uh, previous life as chair of the Environmental Audit Committee, has played a major role in this, because if you don't know, she used to write to Mark Carney, asking them what they were doing in considering these issues and considering some of the things uh, I'm just about um, to talk about. So um, we are seeing this also being recognized in a positive way. So there's, there's a publication called Money Facts, and if you follow in there how they sort of survey and rate um, uh, ethical um, uh, or stewardship funds versus conventional funds, um, you will uh, uh, see that those are now, over the last few years, consistently outperforming conventional funds. So we're starting to see uh, linking money to environmental outcomes does pay. The reason central banks, though, are becoming interested is partly because of that risk issue I mentioned, partly because of the Hurricane Katrina issue and them recognizing the risks of, uh, of climate change, and, uh, and particularly in the insurance element of banks, you know, what are people doing to uh, think about this and plan for this? But they're also looking at it through a different lens. And um, some of you may have heard of the concept of stranded assets, which I'll briefly explain for those of you um, that haven't. But uh, the concept of stranded assets basically means that um, it, it's thought that we have five times the level of proven reserves in fossil fuel uh, uh, deposits and so on that we could possibly burn whilst keeping climate change below two degrees um, Celsius. So if that's right, it's also quite possible, and even if that quantum's wrong, um, we have hugely overvalued assets uh, I in this world based on fossil fuels, and therefore huge overvaluation of our banks uh, and the financial um, uh, sort of investments that they have. So that's why um, this is starting to um, grab attention. And, and uh, actually, the Bank of England, I would say, is slightly behind other countries in starting to consider these issues. Um, but earlier this year, they actually wrote to all banks operating in the UK, including Triodos, asking banks to respond uh, with what their approach is to um, uh, climate risk management and what are they doing to adapt their business models. So there's hope that this thinking is really starting um, to sink in. So, so if large NGOs like Christian Aid and Greenpeace are starting to get this thinking, if, if central banks are and so on, um, what can be done about it? So, um, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you have ever had the huge privilege of seeing a wild elephant push over a tree. Um, uh, I have, and it's quite extraordinary. Um, they don't run at the tree. Uh, they don't pull and yank at the tree. Uh, they walk up to the tree and they, they put the sort of base of their trunk on the other trunk uh, and they slowly sort of ripple it up the trunk of the tree and then eventually their front feet come off the ground and then they start to push through the back legs. So there is continual firm pressure applied as these several tons of elephants start to push over this tree. And they don't flatten the tree. Um, they push it over so far and they walk around and then go and take the fruit and leaves that they want to eat and then they leave it. They leave it in a different form and a new ecosystem's formed as other things start to happen around the root ball as it's exposed uh, and everything else. That's the approach that we need to take to changing banking. 
Uh, I, I'm not an advocate of total um, disruption and, and chaos. We have to apply firm and consistent pressure from numerous angles, from government, from regulators, from, from businesses, organizations, and from individuals. Uh, and I'll come on to um, uh, some of those pressures that, that we could apply. Um, so <coughs> if, in a, if in a later life I, um, I ended up being the first environmentalist to be governor of the Bank of England, um, what might I, what might, actually it's probably a bit harsh because I think we have a very good guy running the Bank of England, but, uh, but, um, uh, but what would I do? Um, the first thing is I think we have to address two uh, main issues, um, two social grievances, if you like, that still exist after the financial crisis. Um, the first is an issue around accountability and diversity in that banks are still too big to fail. 75% of current accounts in the UK are still with these four um, big banks. So we have to diversify this, this market, but that has to be done uh, in the right way. And um, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we have a very small, what's called the social finance market, so organisations that exclusively use money for social uh, and environmental good. Uh, and then the UK banking sector, um, otherwise, in the middle, is absolutely enormous. I, I read something recently that, uh, that, that, that suggested there were over 580 banks operating in the UK to give you, give you an idea of the scale of it. So we already have an enormous sort of um, plethora of, of banks, uh, and that's growing. And some of you will have heard the concept challenger banks, which is typically used to refer to a, a new breed of banks that are, that are, are, are applying for bank and licenses or got them, they're startups trying to bring more competition to the marketplace. Um, and that's great. I don't know if we need 580 or 700. We seem to have enough, but we need to have real, more concrete diversity in scale. Uh, um, but most importantly, what are these challenger banks really about? Are we getting anything different? Um, isn't it just more of the same business model and the same people and the same issues being peddled out? I think what we really need to make sure is we're getting banks that are challenging the way banking is done, not just providing uh, additional competition. Um, uh, and, and so that's the first issue that I think if I was uh, in that high and mighty position I would be looking to address the other thing is culture back to our seal survivor on that beach a victim of that banking culture that's prevailed for the last 30 or so um, years um, and uh, I think what's key to this is the issue of pay and this is the other social grievance we've not addressed um, and, uh, and the issue of um, bankers bonuses in particular we, we've tried to put a cap in place on, on bankers' bonuses and regulation around that, only to find banks finding ways around it and to provide cash allowances as a substitute or to provide um, uh, share options uh, and, and so on instead. Um, so we have to have another go at this, and um, it, it's often sort of dismissed as, well, we can't possibly do this because we'll, we'll lose all the talent to other countries who, uh, and, and so on. And I, I would argue very strongly that's ridiculous because people don't locate solely for money. They locate because of families and communities and connections and a reason to be somewhere uh, as much as anything. And if they are people who are only going to sort of follow the money around the globe, then perhaps they're the wrong kind of banker that we don't particularly uh, want or need. Um, I think um, also uh, on this issue of, uh, of pay, it's interesting that the Netherlands have imposed a much tighter bonus cap than the rest of the EU. And yet, in the post-Brexit world that everybody talks about, Amsterdam is one of the top three cities with Paris and Frankfurt that everybody talks about banks leaving London for. So I just don't think this argument stacks up. And I think really to bring back the right motivations and behaviours in banking, uh, we have to change this culture. Uh, and this, um, this system of pay and remuneration. So, they would be two generic things that I think um, are fundamental to changing our options, our choice, uh, and the culture with which banking operates. But more specific things to do with this refocusing of banking, this repurposing uh, of banking to be a, a positive force for good. The first thing is I think we need a lot more transparency. And um, uh, I think it should be perfectly reasonable for every bank to have to publish a list of the organizations that it lends money to. We do it, we've done it for years, we publish a list of uh, loans and investments that we make worldwide. Um, there are issues with it, you would have to have contractual sort of changes and permissions put in place, but we don't reveal any of the commercial terms, just a list of who you're lending to, what you do with the money. I think everybody should have that uh, right. Beyond that, on reporting, we should be um, requiring banks to align their reporting, to report against their impacts, against the sustainable development goals that Joan referred to earlier. Again, 
In May this year, we did this for the um, first time, so our annual report is now aligned and details under each of the sustainable development goals what impact we feel uh, we're having. Um, we don't claim to have um, a business that, that's affecting each one of them, so it's forced us to think, actually, yeah, what are we doing in respect of each sustainable development goal? What do we aspire to over the coming years? And I'm not suggesting that what I want to do is try and put, um, you, you know, I'm trying to transform every bank to have a halo around its head within the next few years. But if we could do this, it would start that conversation. It would ignite that conversation about, well, what are you doing to reduce your investments or change uh, our energy provision away from fossil fuels or intensive agriculture or polluting industries? Uh, and that's what um, we should be uh, requiring them to do to have that uh, conversation more. Um, and, uh, and this isn't, um, uh, this isn't um, completely crazy thinking uh, by any means. Um, in fact, this uh, report that came out within the last month, uh, I was on the steering uh, committee of this advisory group report to government. Uh, this is really looking at how could we take impact investing um, to scale in the UK? How could we really seriously take it beyond the very small uh, two billion um, sector I described earlier to something that's operating at scale and having um, really significant impact. And um, considering reporting against the SDGs is one of the recommendations within this. It also makes a number of other very useful recommendations about um, providing kite marks on, on investment products and so on so the consumer can actually have some certainty about what they're investing in and what they're being told actually is uh, environmentally um, and socially sound. So we had no idea actually when, um, when I was asked to give this lecture um, um, earlier this year, how of the moment some of this stuff uh, would be. And, uh, and this, is the only, um, this isn't the only piece of work uh, uh, relevant. Um, earlier this year, we also had um, what is a, an industry-led voluntary initiative called Banking Futures produce its second report, and, and it looks at a number of things, but one of the things is um, the issue of long-term investing. How do we actually get away from investing purely for short-term financial gain and consider longer-term uh, value? And... Um, uh, and for me, ownership is also a, a key part of that. I think we need to also have more diversity in the ownership models uh, of banks, um, which aren't purely um, profit uh, shareholder uh, driven. Um, and then um, perhaps um, most interestingly, um, from our point of view, um, we, we aren't a lone voice in some of the things I'm um, saying anymore. And uh, people in all walks of life are waking up to some of these issues and what we could do to actually try and re, uh, recalibrate banking and repurpose it. And um, a few years ago, um, Triodos um, founded something called the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, which is now over 40 banks worldwide that share a similar mission and ethos um, uh, to Triodos. Uh, and collectively, those banks have over 127 billion of assets under management uh, across the world. Uh, and they've collectively formed a voice uh, and produced this white paper um, that was launched in Brussels a few weeks ago called New Pathways. Um, and this makes um, a, 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 an array of recommendations about how practically we could start to um, shift banking in the, the way I've described. And um, if we could just do some of it, and if we could just shift the needle on the dial of banking and how it behaves and what it does just a little bit, the, the ramifications and the impact we can have could be huge. There was just one thing within this report I really wanted to highlight to show you what I'm meaning, appreciating um, there are some bankers in the room, but <coughs> appreciating you a lot of you won't be familiar with um, some of the terminology. Um, banks are, are really um, designed um, using things called risk weightings, risk capital weightings. So banks have to hold a certain level of reserves to buffer them against shocks. And the um, size of that reserve is partly determined by the assets that you're uh, investing in, the loans you're making, uh, and, and so on. So if I take the example of social housing, we're a very large lender um, to social housing in the UK. Uh, it's seen to be a very low-risk sector. We're always going to need social housing, affordable housing, you know, and in the event of calamity that a housing association failed, you could always sell that housing stock and so on. So you can hold much lower levels of capital uh, a, a against social housing loans than you can many other sectors. Um, what that means is it's more profitable for the bank. If you have to hold less equity against those uh, particular um, uh, loans and so on, then they are more profitable, which means also um, uh, the interest rate charged to those projects uh, is lower. So um, social housing um, benefits from very, very low uh, interest rates and is hugely competitive uh, because of the low capital requirements that it has. So if you just pause and think about that for a moment, if you were to 
reverse that. And the issue we have at the minute is our risk capital weight weightings take no regard at all for environmental and social consequences and risks. They only look purely at financial and market risk. So if you were to take that example and reverse it and say, OK, in the um, case of um, fossil fuel uh, industries and so on, if we were to put a higher risk capital weighting onto those investments, those loans, then the reverse would be true. They would be less profitable for the bank and they would be more expensive for the recipient. Um, and then you would really start to see change because if the cost of capital going into particular industries uh, starts to change, then actually their competitiveness starts to change and we get real disruption. And so this is what I think is a really exciting regulatory topic uh, to debate and uh, one I look forward to taking forward as the um, first environmentalist to be governor of the Bank of England. But, uh, <laughs> I, um, uh, but that's, that, that, I hope that explains some real simple practical things that we already have the systems in place that determine what banks do. We just need to grapple with that and broaden the way we think about uh, uh, the, the controls that sit around um, banks. Perhaps, though, the thing that excites me most about some of the things I've talked about being a real possibility is what I see by way of an awakening in con consumer consciousness about what people's money does. And every year we um, sponsor market research around Good Money Week that takes place in October, uh, and this is some of the statistics, but, but we see trends in this awareness increasing and an increasing appetite for people to want to know what their money does. Um, and... Uh, uh, and that's um, hugely uh, encouraging and inspiring um, to see um, because I think that, that is one of the biggest pressures, one of the biggest elephants that we can bring to bear uh, on the banking industry. Um, so uh, money could be a, huge, um, a hugely powerful form of democracy if we were all to try and align our money with our values. And uh, not everyone will share the values of people in this room. Not everybody puts the environment uh, at the top of their list of concerns, which is why you need diversity in banking and why you need debate. But I think we need that choice. So this is another friend of mine. This is the last friend um, you'll meet this evening. This is, um, this is an octopus. If, if those of you that have been diving or, or snorkeling and so on around the world, this is probably uh, the most common view you get of an octopus, not always wonderfully of its face, because they're always tucked up in little nooks and crannies and under rocks, and you're lucky if you see half a tentacle. Um, so the octopus is my metaphor for your typical UK banking consumer. It's just tucked up in its little hideaway. I'm all right, Jack. Thank you very much. I don't want to pop my head out. There are predators about, and I'll, I'll consider changing my banking uh, when, uh, when I need to and when I'm, when I'm hungry and I need something from a bank. That's, that's my metaphor for how we behave as consumers. Although, interestingly, octopuses, when they're hungry, it's mostly when they're hunting at, at night, they completely change personality. They're, they're out there. They have a huge presence. They're pushing their tentacles into every nook and cranny that they can find to seek food and so on. And, uh, and so that's what we need to do is change as consumers. We need to be shoving our tentacles into every aspect of our bank managers that we can find to find out what they're doing with our money and, uh, and how they're running uh, their bank. So, um, and uh, I'd actually done these slides before Blue Planet 2 screened on Sunday evening. I don't know if anybody here saw Blue Planet 2, but for those of you that didn't, all right, you need to be the octopus that strangles the shark. Uh, that's, uh, and for those of you that haven't seen it, I would recommend seeing it. It's uh, truly extraordinary. So um, that's how you use your democratic um, uh, power. And really, finally, on that, um, on that theme... Um, uh, I suppose um, we've recently seen the, um, the, uh, the Paradise Papers and the, the controversies naturally uh, spiralling from those, which are, they're about something different, they're about tax avoidance. But the interesting thing is, whether it's the royal households, whether it's famous pop stars, the common excuse that's made is actually, um, we had no idea. We had no idea what our money was doing. Well, I think my great aspiration is that in 30 years' time, say, um, it's become as socially unacceptable to not know what your money is doing and what impact it has on your uh, children and grandchildren's future uh, well-being and so on, as it is now as socially unacceptable to drink, drive and to uh, smoke around small children and in public places as it was um, 30, uh, as it is different to how it was 30 years ago. Um, there's probably an exception in Lord Ashcroft because I think he probably knew exactly what his money was doing. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you, understand, uh, you understand my point. And um, 
Uh, that's the sort of change we need to see within our society if we're really serious about delivering on the sustainable development goals uh, and having a holistic, integrated banking system um, that supports those. So lastly, um, I'd like to just point the finger at you in this audience. Um, I'm a great believer that you can't say you're something, be something, and do something different. And uh, inevitably, because of the transparency we don't have within our banking system, there will be huge hypocrisy uh, in this room in terms of what your own money does, in terms of what the money uh, of the organizations that you all represent uh, does, and so on. And, uh, and I would challenge you all um, to think about that um, after today. Uh, and I come across examples of that all of the time in my life. I did in my previous life. Uh, uh, organizations running campaigns uh, against things that they have no idea that their reserves are being used to actually finance. Uh, I, I spoke to a, a local authority recently that was um, running a, a, a huge campaign that, um, again, they have enormous reserves in. There's a, a very large ENGO in the, in the UK that, that part of its business model is dependent on a huge stocks and shares portfolio that generates a very large part of its income. Well, um, six of the um, major... Uh, uh, tracker stock market tracker funds in the UK alone have over 500 million invested in British American tobacco on its own, just that one company. And that, for me, is the ultimate example of an industry. Apologies to any smokers in the room, but uh, it's, it's, the, it's the single most obvious example of an industry that internalizes all of its profits and externalizes all of the social and environmental I impacts that, uh, that come with it. So, so I would like to just point that finger at this room as well and uh, make that call for you to release your inner octopus. So, um, so I hope the message is clear that we need to move from the elephant bull seal to the seahorse. We need elephant pressure to help us, and we all have to release that inner octopus. Thank you very much.